Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know it's being powered by Hockey Wraparound. Full disclosure, I'm one of the owners of Hockey Wraparound, and we are really more than privileged to be sponsoring the show. It's grown a great audience of hockey coaches, hockey players, hockey parents. Uh, really quickly, Hockey Wraparound, our mission is to make the game more accessible around the globe. And to do that, we make a product that you can put on the bottom of an ice hockey stick to keep it from getting destroyed on rough surfaces. You can play anywhere outside. So if you're a parent or a coach and you've got kids that are using their $200, $300 sticks outside on the concrete and destroying them, we stop that from happening. You can check us out at HockeyWraparound.com and use the code OKPH for 15% off your order. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And above all, enjoy this episode. Thanks so much for your support, and we'll see you next time. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world. It is Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias. That's Christy Casciano Burns and Mike Benelli. And today we have a very exciting episode, the one you've all been waiting for. There have been some rule changes made within USA Hockey, and we're going to try and attempt to go over them. We do have a level five coach with us today, but disclaimer, he even says that he is still learning these as well. But we had to do it as hockey moms and dads and coaches and former players. We had to do this episode for you. We want to thank you for once again listening to Our Kids Play Hockey. We have a pretty loyal listening base now, guys. I'm pretty excited about it. So welcome to the show. So uh, as we said, Mike, we're going to lean on you heavily this episode. All right. We're going to go over the new rules and we're going to have a discussion. And hopefully the people listening to this can get their frustrations out or elation out uh, with us together. They can be hitting their hands on their desk while they're listening to this or raising their arms up. But let's dive right into it. Uh, Mike, the first rule that we have to look at is icing. All right. They've changed icing at the youth levels. This is actually a pretty significant uh, change. Um, and there's reasons for it. Now, I'll tell everybody listening to this real quick, Mike, before we jump in, that if you're a traditionalist, uh, some of these rules are going to tick you off. <laughs> but when you understand right. why they're there, it, some of these actually really do make sense. So icing the puck, I'll, I'll read it, Mike, and then we'll dive into it. So basically, the rule states now prohibits all youth levels of play to legally ice the puck during shorthanded situations, except for high school and adult qualifications. So now if you are shorthanded, you can no longer ice the puck. Right. So this is a really, you know, really big problem, right? So it's, it's, so I, I, I always uh, preface all these rule changes or any rule changes to the level of severity of the, of the, I guess the, the anxiety of the parent, not the kid, the kids <laughs> adjust quickly. Yeah. And, you know, and the right. kids just say, oh, well, whatever the rule is, it is like, oh, by the way, now you need to wear helmets, kids in hockey. <laughs> oh, God, it's going to change the game. It's going to ruin the game. Back kids in my not, day, we didn't wear back helmets. In my day, then, you know, well, that's why, you know, I've had debates with people about face masks. Like, well, we shouldn't wear face masks. That's why more kids get head injuries. I was like, okay, I can't, I, I can't go down that path. But on the, on the icing, it, to me, it makes common sense. If you're, you take a penalty, you, you're the team that takes the penalty. So for a parent that maybe has, uh, you know, an, an 8U player and somebody that hasn't played full ice or even had icing in their life, icing is just basically, you know, uh, getting, getting rid of the puck before the red line and throwing it away. So if you're on a penalty kill, you could just take the puck and ring it down the ice. Now you need to, you can't, you, you can ice it still. Icing is not prohibited, prohibited, but it's an icing. So if you throw the puck down the ice and give it away for relief, you need to go back into your zone and take a face off. So uh, no longer are you get a freebie to throw the puck out of the end. I, I just need to know in the stands when it's okay to yell, I use it, I use it. <laughs> Never right. Anymore. Well, we any, so, so, so my, you know? so in, we in, teaching, for that in teaching this at the younger levels already, right. And teaching this with a lot of youth programs already with the icing last year, it really became more of, of saying, well, 
you can ice it. And there actually are times where you should ice it and, or, or, you know, get, get the relief. Right. Um, take a break. To, to yeah. Take the break. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you, I'd rather see you ice the puck and take the relief. Now the whole idea here is obviously we we're trying to develop more skill right. in our players. Right. So now if I'm a defensive player in the defensive zone, instead of just taking the puck and ringing it off the glass, we want to encourage that player maybe to handle it and skate it and look right. up and right. maybe make the pass. And my feeling on this is I just would love to see a lot more shorthanded goals. I think it's going to be a lot of fun when you see all these breakaways of now kids not just throwing the puck away, but actually trying to make plays on the penalty. So how, how do you now incorporate that in your drills as you try to teach kids who might already be in the habit, already have you know it in their minds that this is what I do? Now you've got to change it. So how do you do that? Well, it just goes down to the same philosophy that we're always trying to do is that is, is to enhance puck control, possession, right. and, 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 and zone control. So I want, even if I'm in the defensive zone, uh, you know, I use the philosophy with my players that anytime you have the puck on your stick, you're on offense. So if you get the puck on your stick in, in, in the, in this old rule, in the, in the previous rule, it's defense. It's I get the puck on my stick. I got to get it off my stick by throwing it down the ice and relieving pressure. Right. Now we have to teach kids to possess the puck, keep the puck on your stick, bring pressure to you and release it by giving it to a teammate. And I think that's the nuance there of teaching much more control drills and, and puck possession drills and less chipping and chasing drills. So, and I think at the youth level, that's yeah, a healthy thing. So it sounds like you like this rule change. This is a good one. I like any rule that adds uh, skill to the game. I, right. I think, you know, I don't think it doesn't take a lot of now. There's a lot of there's a lot of mental thought that goes into where do you put the puck on an icing? Like where you can't just throw it up the boards because you can give the other team the puck. So I think it just eliminates a lot of the uh, muscle of just throwing the puck away and then and non-thinking. Now you need to think. And is it going to take time? There's no doubt. I mean, it's going to take. Think about a player that's now 13, 14, 15 years old. That player now has to adjust their game where if you can imagine getting the puck behind the net on the, on the penalty kill, you're, the, you're killing the penalty. Your first instinct right now is to take it and rip it up the glass as hard as you can. Now, you, you, may, you may now think, oh, I, I, I could look up, I could skate, I could see ice, and maybe I make a play. And, and if there's pressure, ice it, and then we get to have a face-off again. No big deal. Right. So I think it's really important just in layman's terms. Once again, what's changing is where on a shorthanded situation, you could once ice the puck for free, get a change. That rule is no longer in place. If you ice the puck shorthanded, it is now icing. All right. Uh, now, Mike, to, to, to support your points, a few things. One is that, look, this is huge. We have to remember a lot of these rules are made with development in mind. Um, you know, so NHL fans and, and, you know, fans of adult hockey and high school hockey, uh, the reason why this rule doesn't make sense at those levels is because goalies can play the puck. It is a much faster transition game. And at that point, you're pretty developed already. At a younger level, as Mike is saying, this is forcing players to have a little bit more of a control mindset, maybe offensive mindset. And honestly, and Mike, I want you to comment on this too. If you watch the NHL right now, this is really being put into practice already. Uh, NHL players typically, especially off the rush, shorthanded, or five on five. Now defense are leading the rush, moving the rush. It's no longer just D to the wing, to the center and out. Um, and we've seen this a lot throughout the NHL. We've seen a lot of forwards come back that kind of forward movement of not giving up possession. So I think this rule really is in line with not just pro hockey, but the development of USA hockey players, as you just said, correct? It, it, it's in line with the whole way down. Listen at the NHL and, and the college level, you, you can't, it's it's hard to be a defenseman and rip the puck up the boards right because now the power plays right. are playing so deep in the zone if you give that free shot to the two defensive players that are up on the blue line you're giving them 10 15 20 feet of free ice for no reason at all if the puck doesn't get out right and so i think in this case it it, it inherently because our our well, it's a whole nother discussion right but our our defensemen are no longer being taught to be defensemen. They're just taught to be a five-man unit. Right. So if that player that gets the puck, if my fan, I know when I coached college hockey, I had this one player that was unbelievably fast and he was probably my best forward. And anytime on the penalty kill, he played big because he could defend and he could fly. And all of a sudden with that little less, you know, and, and the mentality too is 
oh, I'm going to take the puck. I don't need to pass it because I'm down a man. I, I got to hold on to the puck. We have less men. We have less players. And I think this is where I love it. I, I think it's, a, I think it, you're seeing it at the higher levels. It's not formal because already they have the skill level. You don't right. see players right. just ripping the puck off the glass because the defensemen is, are so strong. And so a, a kid, kid like Cal McCarr, he just takes the puck off the glass and puts it on the ice and skates in and shoots. Right. It's right. like you're giving them a free shot. So if you want to try to throw it away and ice it, yeah. But it, the transition's so fast now in the NHL that that goalie sees that that change happening. They hit the far man. Right. It's in the zone anyway. You're, dangerous. you're giving the puck up yeah. so much faster. I think at the youth level, I'm hoping you'll see more defensemen get creative, get to play with the puck, do a little spinoramas down below the goal line. I think it's. I, I think it's gonna. I think it, it, we can start training players to possess the puck more and make smarter plays right. to leave the zone. I think we're just going to see more offense now. Um, and, you know, and, and at the youth level, in theory, you probably should see, you know, you're, you're going to see more whistles, I guess, but maybe if players start, you know, stop icing it <laughs> automatically, right. you'll see less whistles. Well, and, and we get the, I, I was just going to ask you, years. you think there's yeah. when, when the season kicks off you're going to see a lot of whistles right well and you're going to see a lot of you're going to see a lot of gray area and confusion yeah. where was the icing what right. was the icing what you know what, what am i playing that rule and then yeah. remember, officials at the youth level most of the time officiate many levels so they're not just officiating 10 u games they're they could be officiating high school games junior games youth games they have to adjust to all these different rules as well because right. they're different within leagues right and you, know, you, get, you get sometimes it's hard you're out there like oh man what 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 league and what rule are we playing here today we, we should also note too that when you look at rule changes really in any sport you have to look at it from both a micro but really a macro level these rules are not in place for this one season coming up they're in place for the long haul and you know look, look there was i'll give you one that changed when i was playing the clutch and grab rules change so when i was a young player Mike, I was very, very fast. That was, that was my gift, right? But when I was growing up, guy could grab my jersey for four or five seconds, and that was not a problem. It, was, it just wasn't a penalty back then. Um, you know, when they changed that, man, we got whistles every 20 seconds that first season because you just you forget, right? But now the game is totally different. That's not a common practice anymore. So these rules take place over many, many years. Um, so, okay, the first one, the icing rule on shorthanded situations, a good rule. It's a good rule. I think we all agree on that one. Um, I, again, not going to happen at the high school and adult classifications, but, um, anything under that will. And the next one is offsides. Okay. So there's another big one, eliminated tag up offsides at all youth levels of play. Immediate offside is now applied at all levels, except high school and adult classifications. Mike, why don't you walk us through that one? So to, no, like, again, to me, that's easier to explain to a non-hockey player, right? Or to a non-hockey parent. <laughs> The, you, you cannot go over the line before the puck. If you do, it's a whistle. Yes. Done. Done. Instead of, <laughs> as long as you're skating out of the zone and the puck doesn't hit the net first, or the other player doesn't right. lose it, and, you, and another player tries to play it, and then it's going to be a whistle, or it's delayed off sides where everyone has to leave the zone. To, and to, to me, I, I, I think the delayed off sides, um, the whole goal, right, was to speed up the game. But what, what in my opinion, what we what we're trying to do with players is to teach them like in, if you go from let's go from cross ice hockey in cross ice right. hockey there is no offsides so a lot of the ebb and flow of the puck into the zone is down low up high down low up high across down low up high up high down low that's what we're trying to that, that's what i think we're trying to create in the game of hockey now in, in in real hockey full ice hockey it's oh there's nothing there's nowhere to get in the zone my player I have a player in the zone. I can't go over the line. So I'm going to pull up, go back. The D is going to go D to D. That D can now come into the zone right. with the puck. And that it's just, you know, again, in, in theory, it should be enhancing skill development. And to Christie's point earlier, well, then we as coaches need to teach that. Right. You can't just ignore it and say, well, just don't do it. You need to teach the, the positive parts about why we're doing it. Yeah, I think it's that's a really important point, especially kids who are 12 and 13 who are used to playing a certain way. Well, you really have to put it into the drills. You got to you got to drill it into their heads 
and becomes part of the new way they play. That's really important to explain it. You can't just say, yeah, well, oh, think, here's the rule. I mean, yeah, you've got to really about teach think, it. About the, think about the mentality of that, right? If I'm a tennis player and there was some kind of rule that I couldn't hit the ball over the net if a player was in a certain area of the ice and I had to hesitate for that little bit before I decide to hit it or I had to hit it back to my partner, that's a hard thing to do physically and mentally. So to get the kids to understand that, okay, I'm coming down the boards. There's a, one of my players is in the zone. I've got to pull up and look and, pl and move the puck back. And as a coach, I can't, my head can't explode when that player loses the puck at the blue line, trying to go back to my D and I give up a breakaway. I've got to have, I've, I've got to have the ability to know that there's a cushion there because the only other option to going back to the, uh, the icing, the only other option is just to, is just to go off sides on purpose, like just go off sides and take the whistle, like take the safe play. The safe play is, oh, Lee's in the zone, but I feel pressure. I'm just going to dump it in anyway. Now it's an automatic off sides. Right. Now I'm you not know, sure exactly if it goes all the way down to the offensive zone or, the, you know, your, your defensive zone, or it's, a, it's, the, it's the initial face-off. But what I hate to see is coaches that will refer to that and say, just take the, just take the offsides. Be safe. Just, go, just take the offsides, get the whistle. We'll reset after that. Instead of, hey, take a chance, beat that kid, try to go back to D to D, let the D jump in. And when I say D, like I try not to use that terminology anymore either. It's just go back to the player that's at the red line, wherever that is. That could be... P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, whoever it is, use the ice. Don't just throw the puck away. I like the rule. Okay. You so know, two for two. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say this too for all the coaches listening. Um, you know, I've, I've met a lot of different coaches, some good, some bad, some in between. Um, sometimes rule changes can be frustrating for coaches, but I'll tell you all out there, the best coaches, whether they like a rule or not, will be a, make it a chess match they'll tactfully find a way to make it work for them. So when I see a rule change like this, Mike, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, if you complain about it or just find the easy way through it, of a, like you said, just get it in and get the whistle. Okay. But the coaches that start working on this immediately and figure out that regroup D to D pass into the zone are going to have a massive advantage. They're going to have a massive advantage on the other team. Uh, naturally it's going to help them out in their own defensive zone as well. So it's one of those rules where really all these rules is not only to accept it, but to find a way to use it to your advantage. That's what great coaches do, right? Um, in football, Bill Belichick's famous for manipulating the rules to benefit his team. He'll find little loopholes to make it so that the Patriots will win. I'm like, I said, I'm not a Patriots fan, but I admire Bill Belichick's ability to take any rule and find the loophole or find the way to make this work within his team. So that's something great, great coaches do now. This next rule. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Well, well, you know, one thing, on, one thing on that too, Lee, is think about the fact that how we look at players and right. how maybe that player that we normally would put on the defense, uh, a traditional defenseman, might be your right winger because that player doesn't have to go into the offensive zone. He's actually going to draw players to him to right. release our speedy winger who's actually on the other side of the red line right now. And you see the NHL is doing this exact same right. thing, right? Absolutely. Look, look, every power play in the NHL is based off of getting to the blue line, establishing lanes, giving it back to a player who then enters the zone. And because they don't want to dump the puck in, they want possession when right. they enter the zone. And if right. they're going to dump the puck, it's going to be strategic. So think about the youth level. If I'm now, a, if I can train my defenseman to know you're just going to you skate as long as you want, because you're not going to be able to dump it in, skate as long as you want, look, make the pass back to that player who now opens up the ice. Right you strategically think about a different way to play the game. And now no longer do you have right wing, left wing centermen, which is where we want the game to evolve, where we have just five man, five player units in the zone. Everybody knows what those units should be accomplishing. And whoever does it is just based off of their own skill development. I'll say as well too, you know, at my, my time in the youth level, which has been short, I have seen coaches at the youth level who give their players no positions. And I'm not kidding. Like a youth team with no positions, they just play whatever they get on the ice and play, which I'm not for. Uh, and then I've also seen the extreme opposite where at the youth levels, they have extreme positions, which I also think is a mistake. But like you said, Mike, it's about finding uh, different skill sets, teaching different skill sets, finding different tactics and making them think the game. Look, 
if I think one of the bigger changes from an analytics standpoint over the last 15 years is the importance of possession and not giving up the puck because players are so skilled nowadays that giving up the puck is, it can be dangerous. Right. So a, a lot of these rules, at least these first two, I think are in place from a development standpoint, when you look at the USA hockey model to create better players with better possession, better mindset, and really taking hockey, Mike, th- this is how I look at it. We're, we're going from the Neanderthal hockey of the nineties right to the chess match that hockey is and it's beautiful when you get to that side of the game um now the next rule has nothing to do with on the ice this one's a little depressing to me uh this is something that that i'm gonna be able to get over but i think this is gonna gonna be sour for a lot of people uh age classifications it's finally happened they have removed the descriptions from each age group so from now on might squirt peewee bantam midget gone don't exist anymore. It's just going to be uh, 15 only tier one age classifications. Mike, you said this before. I think you said it's 15 U and that's the way it's going to move forward. So I, this one's a little bit like, ah, we're taking some of the fun out of it. I don't know what the thought process is behind this. Uh, but Mike, why don't you enlighten us a little bit? And this, and this isn't brand new either because we've been transitioning toward this been. for we a couple been. of years now. Right. Yeah. This is just well, it's the official hockey. dumping of it. Yeah. I know, I know, and I know in my end of things, like when we're, when we're given stuff from the USA hockey perspective, it, it's been, it, you know, I, I don't remember the last time I saw Mike squirts peewees, right. like I just, even in there, even in the practice planning book, you know, our friend Chuck Ridley helped design. It wasn't like the squirt manual. It was a 10 U manual. Right. And so I think that it's been going there. Right. But I, I, and honestly, from my point of view, from somebody that plays that, that has his kid and coaches in, in multiple sports, I don't, I, you try to, you try to describe why to a parent, why a midget is not as older and stronger than a peewee or a or a squirt or a mite. So it is a very, you know, and, and, and really they they all sound like small little groups to me. Right. I mean, you know, so, so to me, if you're a midget or you're or, or maybe bantam, bantam should have been the highest, I think, right. I don't know, but I think, or, you know, what is a gigantic. bantam? Do we even know what a bantam is? Someone knows what that is. Yeah, no, but yeah. So, so I think in in this case, I know it, it gets uh, it get now again to to a lot of people, including probably me. I get very sensitive with classifications. I get sensitive with the difference between eight U and U eight. To right. me, is 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 a cavernous piece of, of of information I need to know for my kids. Am I is my son joining the eight U program or is he not eligible because he's eight and he's joining the U eight program? Right. So I think having Distinct class, and now you go to lacrosse. They go by high school graduation year birth, <laughs> which I don't even know. Like, I don't even know how you like. Oh, what? What's your kid? Oh, he's a twenty twenty five. He's a thirty six. Yeah. What does that <laughs> even mean? What does that mean? You could be any age, and you could just have to be. You could be whatever age you want to be. You just have to be. You graduating at a certain time in your life. So I think. I think in this case for hockey, I like. I like the. I like the change in classification of the names because right. I think it gives us a more universal reach to parents that aren't involved with hockey their whole life to know that what am I joining? What's that? What's that NHL learn the play program? It's 10 U. Oh, so my son's 10. He could join it. He's in or yeah, she. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you're right there too. Yeah. Um, it, and it has been going in this direction for a couple of years now. And I, I haven't seen the mites used in a couple of years now. Um, I kind of out of habit, I'll say, Oh, is your son a mite player? And the new hockey parent will look at what's a mite? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's eight you correcting me. So it's already uh, that language is already a part of the hockey community now. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. I think, we that, I think we used that in a previous episode too, just on on you know describing your kid like my son. I have an I have an 07 and a thirteen. So it's I, like, like, they're like, what the hell is that? What do you need? Yeah. <laughs> in 07. What does that even mean? Uh, I, think so I think about you're not, you're a hockey person, you know, I think right. about how the mighty ducks is going to be aged. Now. I think about how mites on ice is going to become eight. You on ice, all these yes. wonderful things. No, but honestly, um, it's not that big of a deal, right? The, the, no, as you guys have said, it's been going that way for a while. Uh, yeah. Mike, for any new hockey players out there, uh, let's just go through it. If, if, unless I'm mistaken, uh, Adams is probably still going to be a thing, which is basically learn to play, 
right? Um, eight U is mites, right? This is, I'm just saying, this is what it was, right? It's eight U, 10 yeah, the U. First, so the first category right. you come into hockey in, in, in the world of USA hockey is yeah. eight U. So eight U. You, whether you're right. eight U, five, six, four, three, two, doesn't matter how old you are, you're right. eight U, you're an eight U category. And then uh, 10 U is 10, yeah. 10 and under. Yeah. Yep. 12. Then it goes by every two years. So you'll see a lot of programs that will go major minor. So you'll have a 12 U major, 12 U minor, which is a, that's a whole nother category. <laughs> USA hockey does. Uh, they, they don't see major minor as distinct age groups. Now there's a, there's a lot of proponents of hockey in Europe and a lot of national like studies that would say, well, we should even have our kids playing within their actual year of birth year. Right. So like a, like a, a like if you're a 2007 year of birth, you shouldn't be playing with 2007 and 2008, which would be 14 U. You should only be playing with 2007. So that's a whole nother, you know, debatable thing. But as far as the language goes and the rule changes that we're talking about, it's, uh, you know, 8 U, 10 U, 12 U, 14 U. And then when you get to 15, 16, those are those aren't U's. Those are just those year yeah. of birth or those, those ages. Yeah, we're high school. Right. And so. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting thing. It, it, look, the, as a as a younger hockey parent, the the age groups I always think about are that twelve and fourteen time period when you know puberty hits, and you might have one kid who's six two and another kid who's five one. You just you know you never know. But th that's one of the reasons these classifications exist as well, in my opinion, and that's why there's an up and down and all over the place. So anyway, the, the end of an era there, really officially the end of an era with, uh, with all, I'm just going to say all them right. all one more time for the last time I'll say them. Adam, might, peewee, oh, I forgot squirt, bantam, midget, gone. That's it. Can't say them anymore. Uh, I did it out of order, so I feel bad about that. All right. This next one is, I have a note here. It says crazy, but true abuse of officials and other miscellaneous stuff. This one, you know, when I read this one, Mike, I was like, is this, is this a thing? So and if it's written this way, it means it's happened. So it says adds vaping right. to actions deemed prohibited under this rule and replaces bench minor with game misconduct penalty for violation. So I guess vaping has reached hockey. <laughs> uh, listen, yeah, when I, I was like, the reason, the reason it was funny to me is because I remember distinctly growing up, you know, with multiple dads on the bench with cigars. <laughs> I mean, it was right. It was just a different time. Right. But different time. Different time. It was right. big stogie, you know, on the bench yelling and screaming at you. So when I when I saw that that they had to put in a rule of no vaping on the bench, I'm just visualizing that that parent sitting there or in the penalty Someone box. Someone did know, it. Taken away. Somebody yeah, did. Somebody, somebody did, did it. it enough. <laughs> somebody did it enough. <laughs> enough. Where yeah. they had to put a rule. In. Right. Look, just for everybody listening. Uh, Wait a minute. So there's now a rule. I I've never seen that on the bench. They had to make a rule. So it must. So it, they had to make a rule because. Coaches were doing this. Somebody did. They're vaping it. on the bench. Somebody, Somebody did. did it. Somebody did it. And it, it, look, here, here's the deal. This is what I'm going to tell everybody. All right. Uh, personal oh. decisions are personal decisions. You, you do whatever you want outside the rink. Uh, some just quick advice I got from a lot of physical trainers. Uh, if you want to be a competitive athlete or be a good role model, don't put anything in your lungs other than air. <laughs> that was one of the best advice I ever got. Keeping in mind that the smoking industry and vaping industry cost this country over $800 billion in healthcare costs a year. That comes out of your taxes. So anyway, that's your disclaimer for the day. Although I, 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 there is something- If any kids are listening, please don't, discourage yeah, that locker room because it ha we know it happens. It's not going to make you a better to hockey player. Say this isn't cool. Yeah. You, need to, you need to be the leader there. If you're listening to this show, it will not make you a better hockey player. That's, that, would, that was enough for me when I was growing up. It, it will make you worse. It'll make you a lot worse. So, and again, Mike, while there is some nostalgia of the old, ah, cigar, you know, it's just, that's, that's before we probably knew as much as we did now about uh, cancer and lung disease. So um, yeah, don't vape on the bench. <laughs> we'll get a misconduct penalty. This is like one of those laws where it's I like, I can't believe that it actually happened. <laughs> and they have now have to have a role. This is one of those like, laws you read about where it's like, you can't walk what your alligator that? down the street nice. in Kentucky, <laughs> right? Like you can't, you can't illegally have a kangaroo in Utah. It's like one of those laws. No Somebody doubt. did when it. You see, when you see it, when you see it in writing, you're like, oh, you'd have to go. Really? Yeah. I want to yeah. find the, the coach or the whoever volunteer that was doing that. It's like, no, it's not the same. It's vaping. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's, the it's same. just it's water. Just, it's just water. It's paper. All right. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, for you out there, 
uh, if you're vaping on the bench. Can't do it anymore. Done. Uh, Done. The, these Done. next two rules. Uh, these are actually... So again, I can tell you right now before we get into these. Traditionalists are going to say this is one of those... Oh, you're making people weak. This is soft. This we don't need. Yep. This is this is actually a rule that uh, I really like, uh, and I'll explain that in solo, Mike. But there's two. There's a few things here with body checking. Okay, so first is in, uh, body checking incorporate incorporates language from the Declaration of Player Safety, Fair Play, and Respect to more completely define what legal body checking is. All right, and Mike, I'm going to read this next one too because it says along with body checking, competitive contact changes body contact to competitive contact. So body contact now is going to be known as competitive contact, which I really like for multiple reasons. It incorporates language from the Declaration of Player Safety, Fair Play, and Respect to more completely define competitive contact. Um, I really like this, Mike. I'm going to let you talk about it first, but I think this is totally perfect for the game. Right, but I just need a clarification. So we don't call it checking anymore? Do you still call it checking? Or is it now called contact. body contact? <laughs> so you don't call it checking. So well, no, checking checking's a, aye, aye, aye. Checking, no. checking is different. Okay, no, so, mine's no checking. <laughs> so Christy, Christy, checking is a Mama. tactic. You know, checking is a skill. Okay. It is a tactic. Okay. It's how you do okay. it, which is being redefined. So again, look, okay. if I, if I hit somebody from behind, I check them. Yeah. All right. And at the okay. same time, if I hit someone sticking to the boards, I check them. So checking right. to me is like passing, like shooting, that's where I, I group the word in. But in terms of okay. body contact, they're redefining what is a legal check and we're redefining right, how we're take looking notes at here, Mike. it. Right. Let's, Mike, let's Mike that's my fishing rod in the Follow water. You. You're up. Right. So I love, and I agree with Lee, I like, I like the fact that we're redefining these terms because it makes it easier to teach them. Right. You know, and it, when I teach body contact, it's a form of checking, just like a stick check and a poke check and a, you know, these, there's all kinds of checking that goes on in the game. That's not even eliminated. I mean, you're still, and even like a, a late body contact will be a penalty for checking. Do you want me to read that? Right. You want me to read that rule real quick too? Yeah. Why don't you read that? Let, because this one, this one, uh, this is the most clearly defined I've actually ever seen this and I'm glad they did. It says late body check adds new glossary definition to late body check and is defined as a late check is when a player delivering the check has an opportunity to avoid contact or minimize contact once it is realized that the opponent no longer has control of the puck. The concept of finishing the check is an unacceptable action as it is one that is meant to intimidate or punish the opponent with no intent or possibility to gain possession of the puck. The responsibility is on the player delivering the check to avoid forceful contact to minimize impact to a vulnerable or defensive player who is no longer in control of the puck. We have to also keep in mind this is we are talking youth levels here, even though it's still illegal at the upper levels. We're talking about kids here. Okay, so for all of you out there, it's like, that's taking the toughness out of the game. All right? Yeah. It's not. It's minimizing really stupid injuries that don't need to happen. Mike. Right. So competitive <laughs> contact. I love I, – well, I just like competitive contact because now Me I'm too. describing it, right? What is competitive contact? That means you are still going hard. You are still being tough. You are still winning battles. You still have to go and, and look for possession and remove the player from the puck. But right. you're going to do that by competing for the puck, not for knocking the guy into next week or the girl, right? And, and I think competitive contact to me, when, it, when, it's, when it's described just like you described it in the rules, and if I'm a coach trying to teach it, it's players. All we need to do is we need to be looking to make a play at the puck first. If in fact that play at the puck results in body checking or a body contact, that's just the, that's the, that's the secondary piece of this competitive. Contact. If your initial job is to go bury this person and the puck right. is laying between your feet, that is a penalty. That's been a penalty now for a couple of years, actually. Right. So the, the objective here is to remove that language so that we can teach, I think, to teach it better. I want right. competitive contact. That means if I'm going against the wall with a player and another player comes in, he can't just bury the person that I'm competing against. That person needs to go in and make a competitive play at the puck and make the play happen as opposed to when I taught checking for years and years, it was, you know, it was two reasons for checking, right? Remove the player from the puck and change momentum of a game. 
So intimidation. So you want to intimidate the player and you want to remove the player from the puck. That just, that's old school. Right. That doesn't, can't, that doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's the intimidation factor and the, the, the process of the, the player declaration of play, you know, the player safety declaration that all is, uh, you know, this is all encompassing all these different aspects of checking and body contact because we're trying to eliminate just open shots with no consideration for the player's safety or no consideration that the actual objective is to get the puck right. <laughs> and, and play. And I think yeah. that's where, and I think that's what I like about the change in the, in the verbiage is that I think it's going to be easier to teach. Yeah. And, oh, and I'm all for that because there are times I've been, I've watched my kids games with my eyes wide shut. You know what I mean? You, you, you get the game gets so out of control, so many dirty hits. And, um, and, and there have been times when they just had to end the game just because the kids couldn't play um, fairly. And it wasn't a chess match. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> it looked like a little war zone out there. So this is great. If, and especially, and we're going to hear a lot of whistles and I'm okay with that if it's going to prevent injuries. Well, it's very similar to Elite's saying earlier about the when, when you started to like bet you if you watch like in the Stanley Cup finals of the 80s, players didn't have hands. Like they couldn't move. Like it was just hook and hold and grab and slash and and you know, literally guys grabbing sweaters. Right. Right. And now now it's all about, hey, can I and maybe it's not at you know for traditionalists, but you watch these little kids, you watch eight, nine, ten year olds that have been playing cross ice now for a couple of years, they know how to go in and toe drag the puck and walk around something. Now, a lot of, and you see it on Twitter and everything else, like a lot of people like, oh, if that kid ever tried that, you know, Michigan move in my day, I would have just crushed them. Yeah, but isn't that one of the coolest moves you've ever seen in your life? And isn't it changing the way goalies play? Isn't it changing the way defensemen play? Because now you're adding a whole different, imagine if Wayne Gretzky knew how to do the Michigan back in the day with all the time he used to have behind the net. I mean, think about, like all the crazy goals that would have happened. So I just think when you take, when you look at body contact and checking and you, you start to understand that it's not, we still want checking, but we want to understand that checking is occurring because of the play at the puck, not, not to, to just see a body and crush the body. So Mike, when Good. I coach, Yay. I when, applaud when, this one. When I coached, uh, college and even even at the professional level, I tried to get my players to understand checking as a tactic, not as like like you said as an intimidation device. And look, don't get me wrong. I, I gotta give like a little bit of little bit of uh, understanding here. Look, I'm from Philadelphia. I grew up idolizing the Broad Street Bullies and that 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 style of hockey. Okay, so so you know when I was growing up, it was all about toughness. And then obviously when I was a, a young kid, Eric Lindros, this gigantic six foot five guy that could take you and just wipe the ice with you. You know, that's the era I grew up in. Now, listen, here's the deal. Eric Lindros had massive concussion problems, right? Um, as you said, we didn't know about CTE in the mid seventies. We didn't know about concussion protocols. We didn't know what these injuries could do. Um, and the truth is this, when they, when they locked the NHL out in 2005 and they came back with a lot of new rules to enhance the gameplay, we're what we're, we're 16, 17 years from that now, right? The game is better. The game is more fun to watch. The game is a chess match. It's faster. And, and as you just said, Mike, the Michigan now is becoming something that happens in NHL games. You can literally see the game evolving from a skill standpoint. So checking should be involved in that as well as a tactic. All right. And as you said, I want to reiterate this for the coaches. Look, I get the thrill behind a big hit, uh, but rarely does it do anything for you. All right? Rarely. It does. I understand sometimes it shifts momentum. The truth is this, if you're playing the whole game well, you won't even need to do that, all right? Separating a player from the puck or competitively working. When you look at the NHL again, one of the things that I thought they'd never be able to change this, and they did, was uh, plays behind the net when, when the puck's not ice, but two players are going for it. And we saw incredible hits and incredible injuries. Uh, uh, Travis Roy, uh, God rest his soul, was a victim of that. He went into the boards, got checked, broke his neck, and became quadriplegic. So... I thought the NHL would never be able to change that, but they did. They changed the rules about hitting behind the net and the players uh, good on them kind of adopted it. And now you don't see too many injuries behind the net anymore. I feel like this is a, another result of that. 
players should be thinking about checking as a tactic to remove another player from the puck or to gain possession from the puck, no longer to intimidate. And again, I know there are going to be traditionalists out there that don't like this. And, and in a weird way, I get it. But here's the thing, man. I don't want my kid to have to deal with concussions. I don't want my kid to have to break a knee or break an arm. All right. That's not, I, that's not toughness to me. That's stupid. All right. Uh, not to mention, too, when you get to the U12, U14, and I talked about this. When you have a kid who's already six feet tall hitting a kid who's 5'2", wh- where is the honor in that? Yeah. Right. I don't, I never understood that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same same way, by, by the way, Christy, wait, real quick, reversing it. I also hated when I was playing and a five, two kid would take my knees out. Right. Like that was horrible too. So I'm just saying that this is good for the game of hockey and long-term. Um, if we want to, if we want to continue to be a top hockey country, we need to keep getting better tactically. We need to get better speed wise. We need to get better skill wise. Christy, I, I apologize. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was just saying from a parent's perspective, being in the stands, and hopefully we'll, we'll be back in the stands this fall, uh, watching our kids. It's hard to watch when the game gets really chippy and out of control and kids get, I mean, don't you just hold your breath when a kid gets hit? Uh, you know, there's a dirty hit and a kid's just on the ice and you don't know how badly they've been hurt. The entire rink just stops you know and you, you say a little prayer for that kid that they're okay right. especially when they're so young I mean you if you can take away the ability for these kids to use their aggressions that they may have and take right. it out on the ice during the game um I'm all for that absolutely yeah you, you, I'll say this too I, I like I, I you guys no, I, I was just going to say real quick, just from a pair, this is, this is my opinion. Okay. And like I said, this is, I, I don't want to speak for the whole group here. All right. Like from a parenting standpoint, look, there are situations your kid in my kids are going to have to go through where maybe they, they, they do get in a scrap off the ice or something happens where they get pushed or they get punched. That's part of growing up. Okay. I'm not condoning it. That's part of growing up. All right. Um, but I don't think there need to be rules or a lack of rules in place to encourage that in an organized sport. All right. And if you understand what I'm saying, okay. Like, like I said, if my kid comes home and say, I got in a fight today, it's going to be, okay. What did we learn about? Why did this happen? But I don't want to necessarily put my kid in a sport where they condone or don't stop it from happening. Again, youth football is another great example of this. They've done an amazing job of really taking unnecessary hitting out of practices. And in some places games, all right, because it, it, the sport was going to die if they kept it up just because of CTE alone. And I think hockey is doing the right thing of like, look, life happens, but we're not going to make rules here where we can condone violence or intimidation um, when it, it doesn't make any sense for the game. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. And, and just, just to, just to kind of, you know, wrap the point up though, it's still there. Is, so what, and one of the things we, we, as hockey coaches and fans of the game, even from the last five years, you, you, we have to get out of the mentality that checking is a part of the game anymore. It really is. There is no, the, the rule is pretty clear that you must be attempting to make a play at the puck. Right. So yeah. it's no longer check the player, get the puck. That's hard. That's really, I mean, for me, that, that's the only way I could play. I mean, I could never reach in there and get a puck from a player. I'm like, what the hell is that? That's hard. Like it's actually harder <laughs> to, right. to angle and understand where to go and, and eliminate players' hands. And, and, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, squeezing players off in the zone, it's harder to teach it. Therefore right. it's easy to teach, just run somebody over your, you know, right. that, that, that's how you talk checking, right? First guy go in, take the body, second yep. guy on, grab the body. Right. I remember that. that. It, and if you're a coach right now that played from 1970 to 1999, you have to understand that that is no longer the game of hockey. One of the reasons why, you know, I get upset when I hear new coaches that are coming into the game, young, young guys and girls that are coming in that always want to get like um, they want to get waved through like level one and level two. Cause they, well, I played college hockey or I played pro hockey. So why do I need to go to level one? Like, what am I going to learn at the level one clinic for USA hockey? Well, you're going to learn that the game is different. Right. The game is not the game you grew up playing. I don't, we don't care about the X's and O's. I could care less about all the other. I mean, obviously all that other stuff's important. Right. And about child psychology and the way we talk to parents and the way we deal with, you know, different people in the game. But one thing that we can't do is get to a point where 
we, un, we, 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 we accept the fact that that's the way the game's always been played. So that's the way we're just going to keep teaching. Right. It. Right. That's not the way it is. You go after the, 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 the mindset is I'm trying to possess the puck. That means my play has to be at the puck. If the kid that's trying to protect the puck happens to be in my way after I get the puck, it's like, remember, you know, if you think about uh, when you're screaming and yelling on a penalty, on a, a kid's on a breakaway, right? And the rule, you, you know, everybody's yelling like the, the defenseman dove and he hit the puck first, but then he tripped the player. And, and every, you could hear every coach saying, well, he, he touched the puck first. So it's no longer a tripping penalty. Well, no, that's, you're still impeding the player's progress. Like, yeah, yes, you, you did touch the puck first, but you, you eventually did trip the player. It's the same thing in checking. Like, you've got to remember, you can't just go out and blow somebody up after you take the puck away from them. And I think even in right. another part of that, that penalty or that, that description is also that little, you know, the player passes the puck. And then, you know, even five years ago, you kind of had like a little count, counter in your head. Oh, Lee got rid of the puck. One, two, three. I can still hit him. That, <laughs> you yeah. can't do it. It's it, got to. It, well, it, it's it, going to create injuries too. It, you got to. Well, and, and it's just, and it's going to create a lot of penalties. You know, it's just I'll, not the rule. I'll take this to an even deeper level. Um, I remember coaches recruiting kids that uh, I don't want to call them troubled, but they would recruit kids that would have no problem fighting. I'll put it that way. That just were a little bit more violent in nature. Okay. Um, well, because they were assets on the ice. They had no problem running into someone and really trying to hurt them. Right. Um, I played with a lot of those people. I was scared of some of those people. I'll admit that right now, if they didn't care. All right. Like, so here's the deal from a, a, a higher level, right? Those kids should still play hockey, but they should have an ability to be within the rule set. And so a coach can actually mentor this kid of, listen, that's not appropriate. This is how you win that battle. This is what competitive contact is. Don't go for his back or his legs. Get the puck. That's how you win this situation, right? So again, there's a higher message here as well of actually mentoring kids. You know, Mike, you're just making me think. It's funny. I remember going through drills on the boards where the whole team would line up about, what, an arm length from the boards. I forgot what we call this. And one, one of us would go through. The gauntlet. Gauntlet, and you hit, 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 hit. And don't get me wrong. Um, sometimes that drill could be fun. All right. It really could. Well, it, if you were the biggest guy. Right. Well, when you were teaching toughness, there was fun aspects, but sometimes <laughs> it, got, it got too serious. And like, look, I had massive shoulder issues when I was a kid, which I, I, I don't regret. I'm not at all saying I wish that had been changed. That that's, that's just what happened to me. Injuries happen, but man, I didn't want to go through the gauntlet after my shoulder surgery. You know what I mean? Like, like things like that. It's like, why are we doing this? What are we doing? And, and here's the thing when it comes to mental fortitude, again, for the traditionalists out there, mental fortitude, fortitude, toughness, uh, intestinal fortitude, right? There are ways to teach that without being overly physical. All right. Team building, team bonding, team messages, sticking up for the person next to you. There are ways to teach that without physically hurting someone else. I know because See, I do it. And this, <laughs> and this is a, but, this is a, but this is a great time to teach that too, as a coach, that right. tenacity and, and not giving up on the puck right. and, and, and right. the player that has the puck starting to understand, well, I'm not going to get checked here, but I've got to be able to wheel and deal. I got to be able to go left, right, left, right, right, right again. Right. I've got to be able to turn, protect the puck, protect my, my body because I'm, I'm now, at least I know. Now we also have to teach the fact that if Mike Benelli's coming in on you. You don't, I don't care about the rule. If I'm going to check you from behind, I clearly don't care about the rule. Right. 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 So right. I need to, I need to teach my players You've got, to, you've got to anticipate that every player doesn't care about the rule. Just to your point, Lee, there's a lot of kids out there that don't care about the consequences. They, don't care. Of it. they, want, they want to do it. They want to hit so and get out of the game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's teach our players to not only learn how to protect the puck and possess it, but put themselves in really good body positions that now they can anticipate the fact that there's not going to be a check, but they've got to anticipate the fact that there's going to be reckless play. Right. And I think this gives us more freedom, more time, um, you know, I, I, like, I, I like that. Like to me, I love the, the automatic, you know, you beat the guy down the puck, get down the ice for the, uh, for the, uh, for the icing on in the NHL. Cause it, ha right. it has to be right. eliminating hundreds and hundreds of, of injuries. Right. And it just, and it just becomes, a, uh, it just becomes who's the fastest player. It right. Just and becomes it, well, it becomes a, a tactic. It becomes a skill. Like you said, like, again, it, with checking competitive contact as a tactic, all right. Like, again, right. I think, I think as youth coaches don't see that side of the game enough. Um, again, look, we, we always have seen the big shot. We've always seen the fastest skater, 
There's never yeah. been enough onus on good playmakers, especially at the youth level, because we put too much onus on goals, right? Uh, even though Wayne Gretzky had more assists than goals, if he never scored a goal, he would have still been the number one player of all time, right? But other things too, like, like game sense. Um, again, look to the listeners out there, you want to know the biggest difference between the professional levels? If you have an aspiring kid, it's game sense. It's not speed. It's not strength. It's game sense. You can go to an AHL game and an AHL game. Almost all those players are the same skill level. All right. Maybe a 1% variance. It's game sense that separates them. All right. That's why Sidney Crosby is who he is. That's why Conor, Conor McDavid's the fastest kid alive, but that's also, he's got a lot of game sense. You can see that one more quick story real, real quick before we start wrapping this up. I remember when um, in, in back in the lockout 2005, I was training to go up to the minors and I had a, a really, I was really privileged to have the opportunity to skate with uh, the New Jersey Devils when they weren't playing a lot of their players and a bunch of D1 college kids. And I, I learned more in maybe these six, seven sessions than I did any other point in my life. And one of the things, Mike, I learned this really quick was like second, third chance opportunities. When a guy would come in with me one-on-one, -on -one, I remember maybe sometimes I'd stop him with my foot. He wouldn't give up on the puck. He'd keep slapping at my feet till he got the puck through my feet. And I'll tell you what, he did. And I realized in that moment of like, man, I give up on the puck more than I think I do, right? A guy stops it. These guys were relentless on keeping the possession, all right? And again, this is around the time period where these rules started to change. So if you're a coach, if you're a player or you're a parent, you know, understanding that your kids don't turn away from the play, be relentless on the puck, be relentless on the puck, get it through that player's legs. Don't stop if they do it. How many rink turns do we see? Like that, that used to be a pet peeve of mine as a coach. If you're doing a rink turn, when the transition, the whole game's built on transition, stopping on a dime. So a lot of these rules, especially the ones we went over today are there to, again, create different tactics for different things like checking to create more skill development in situations that require it at the youth levels. Got to get, keep all these, almost all of these are youth levels, except for the checking one. Right. And it continually changing the game to create better hockey players, not just in the USA, but wherever you play. Right. The game has changed again. People who hold on to kind of either the Broad Street Bullies era or the 90s era, I mean, like, we're, we're 20 years past this now, a minimum. <laughs> the game's changed. The game's changed. And, and I, it's better to watch. I, I still say this, that even just from a fan point of view, it's so much more fun to watch hockey than any other sport. I don't, I don't, I don't know how baseball fans continue. I, I've equated baseball guys, not that there's anything wrong with playing baseball, but like Major League Baseball to me is like the, the boyfriend or the girlfriend that keeps cheating on you and you keep going back. Like, I don't understand why people give money to that league anymore, right? Nothing against, there's nothing wrong with playing baseball or softball. I do love those sports, but hockey is the greatest sport on the planet for a reason. Again, I have never met anyone ever that's gone to a hockey game or got involved that was just like, eh, it was all right. <laughs> no one, right. it doesn't happen. <laughs> all right. So anyway, Christy, I want to give you any final thoughts you have too. This is a good episode going over. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure there's going to be a contingent out there that says, hey, it ain't broken. Oh. Why are you fixing it? Well, the, the, <laughs> it's broken. It you is know? broken. I, this is based on research, observation, maybe on the number of injuries. I mean, it, this isn't, you know, out there to, to upset you. It's right. to make the game better for our kids, to improve the game, to make it safer for them. Um, and for the peanut gallery, you need to learn these rules too, because you want to be embarrassed when you're yelling out uh, for yeah. icing calls, because you know more than the ref, obviously. Yeah, and the so coach. educate yourself <laughs> on the rules. So you don't sound stupid. You don't sound stupid in the peanut Shoot gallery. The puck. When you're Shoot the, it! Shoot the, the puck. rules have changed. <laughs> I always love oh, that. Check one. them! No, they, we Hit don't them. do that. Shoot it! Anymore. Shoot the puck! <laughs> Yes. So take time to learn these rules too. And remember, <laughs> as well as the, if you want toughness, and you encourage your kids with. that this that it's different. You know, you got to play a little differently. This is going to make the game better. So be right. that support network for them. Don't be the naysayer and put negative thoughts in their head like this is stupid. Yeah. No, it's not stupid. We're changing it to make it better for you. Right. <laughs> it, 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 the the game will never stop changing. That's the point. Rules right. will always keep changing. Like I said, if you want. Yes. Go play rugby. It's out there. There's right. a you can do it. Yeah. You want to teach some toughness? Go play rugby and then talk to me. Yeah. Right. Mike, any final right. thoughts? Well, yeah. Well, two things, right? And I think Christy brought up the good point that now, so I'm looking at the rule, the rule changes, not the rule book, just the changes are 11 pages long, right? So there's 11 pages of rule manipulation and changes. So to Christy's point, 
Don't be yelling at your coach or the coach yelling at the official or even the officials yelling at the coach before you read those 11 pages and just understand those little nuances and knowing your own, your own level. Like just know that USA hockey rules are different than some tournaments rules and USA hockey's rules are different than the NCAA's rules. Right. And so don't, don't say, well, the, the, you know, the Blackhawks did this last night and you look at, they, they didn't do this. well, this isn't the Blackhawks. This is Shoot! the, this, Shoot this is the, the eight, this is the eight U Blackhawks. I so, used to... or, or in Lee's turn, they're in Lee's town. They're the U eight Blackhawks, but come on, they, you know, come on, right, man. Screaming and yelling. And I, and I do think from the old, from the, from the old school part of you, and I'm an old school guy. I like, yeah, I like we hockey both are. We both are. where it is, but understand this that we're all I, and then we've all, i think us three especially have seen this because the hockey world is so small we think yeah. everybody loves hockey and nobody likes hockey it's not big enough it's not soccer right. it's not <laughs> football not cool. it's not football imagine in football every time there was a a, a down a, that a fight broke out imagine like <laughs> in rugby in rugby you don't even see fist fights right and that's the one of the toughest sports you've ever seen in your life lacrosse you don't see people smacking each other and then dropping the gloves so <laughs> When I hear, well, people watch hockey because of the fights, I'm mm-hmm. like, you know what that is? That's, I just think that's an uneducated hockey fan base, and we need to change that. If you want, right. have, if you want to bring more people into the tent, you've got to, you've got to make it more appealing to dads and moms and, and kids. What kid wants to watch a game and go, oh, that looks like fun. All five kids get to drop the gloves at the center <laughs> ice to have a fight before the game starts. This is the that's coolest that's- sport I've ever seen well, in my life. What kind of a kid so does that I attract? Just think it's yeah. Happy. Yeah, I mean, well, and, and again, but a lot of, you know, would say to the, you know, well, that's the kind of kid I want. I want that tough kid. I want the kid that's going to slash somebody from behind. I want the kid that's going to, you know, kick somebody in front of the net because I want to win. So, but can I have the kid that wants to do the Michigan and score 15 goals a year that way? I want that kid. I want the kid that's going to try those kind of neat things and be good with his teammates and be supportive and be a back checker and a four checker and a, and to Lee's point, you know, just a, a dog on the puck, you know, just to, like, you, you think about, you watch a dog play with a, you know, a stick handling ball in the driveway, or you got your green biscuit out there and yeah. your hockey wrap around and you're doing your stick handling and you watch that dog. It just does not let you go. doesn't let you go. doesn't just quit. doesn't say, Oh, that was too hard. They go, 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 go. And I think that's where we want to teach our kids that you just go, 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 get off the ice, get a little rest, go back down go, go, go. And I think that's where the rules and some of the, the point of emphasis that we're trying to make with players, it's not taking away competitiveness. It's not taking away toughness. It's not taking away, you know, it's not making players softer. I think it's just making players more skilled, more tenacious, more hungrier. And I, I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, eight to seven games. Like that's, I'm like, that is just like, Oh my God, did you see that goal? Or did you see that play? Or do you see that save? I don't know. I think this. I think more kids would rather play in a in an eight seven game than a, than a one nothing uh, or one nil game. Yeah, go play yes. soccer if you want to. I agree. Yeah. All so, right. Uh, this was, I learned uh, a I lot. Great guys. Guys look I think I think it's great that we reviewed the rules. And again, I, I don't I don't, I don't I, the disclaimer is I don't know if, you know right. I don't know where the rules came from or who's deciding them. Uh, you know, it's obviously these committees. Everyone in USA Hockey, we're all members. You all get to write in petition rules. If you don't like 8U hockey being cross ice, change the rule. If you don't like yeah, helmets on the action. ice, change the rule. Just, yeah. just be there and, 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 and be, be active. Just to continue the disclaimer, I do want our audience to know we are not official representation of USA Hockey. These thoughts are ours. Right. And we are just reviewing rules. As Mike said, there are 11 pages of rule changes. That is the official place you should go at usahockey.com to review these. Uh, do not let this episode, although it was very fun, do not let this episode be your official uh, – uh, understanding oh. of these rules and look at the end of the day just final thought hockey players will always be tough all right there's a big difference between toughness and intimidation hockey players have always been tough the way we play through injuries if you need a fix of uh violent hockey go to youtube right that's what it's there for go to youtube and you can look up 90s montages or 70s montages and you have unlimited footage the game's trending in another direction um and i and i really love the direction it's going in it look, look this is my gauge guys is like I think about when I was a kid, I was like, would I want to play the way the game is today? And the answer is yes. All right. There are people out there that probably say no. All right. But for me, it's a yes. I'd want to play in the game the way it is now. I would love to have grown up in that. So again, we hope you're enjoying this episode. Had a laugh with it, just like us. Uh, Make sure to leave a review. Make sure to give us five stars. Make sure to tell your friends about it. 
help us get this out there. It's been growing every week. Again, we know a lot of you listen to this. Okay. We can see the audience is coming in. We're really flattered by that. Uh, we're trying to grow the channel. So make sure you comment, like, like I said, give us a review on whatever podcast channel you're on uh, and keep the show going again. You can always check out this episode and more episodes at Our Kids Play Hockey. We're over 36 episodes, if you can believe that, guys. I can't believe we've done that many already. But, uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, and, again, wherever podcasts for, uh, can be heard. This is Our Kids Play Hockey for Mike Benelli and Christy Cassiano burns I'm Lee Elias, and we'll see you next week. Have a great one, everybody. And remember, competitive contact moving forward. Take care.